have uh, Kripa Gauri Shankar from Azim Premji University, which is uh, uh, outside Bangalore, Greater Bangalore area. Uh, uh, okay. So, <laughs> so yeah, maybe I'm doing a poor job of introduction. So Kripa will give her <laughs> herself, and her talk is about using random numbers to solve combinatorial problems. We welcome Priya, uh, Kripa. Okay, so uh, let me introduce myself first. Uh, actually, my introduction is a little bit relevant to the material of the talk as well. Um, so I think I should tell you. Uh, my name is Kripa and I teach undergraduate students like you. I'm actually a physics person. Um, so I do mathematics in a very dumb way. Okay. Um, and uh, I teach in a place called Azim Premji University in Bangalore and uh, it's we have an undergraduate program where uh, students are you know from various disciplines and they also are allowed to take courses from other disciplines so for example if you are all mathematics students then you would also be maybe you would have the opportunity to take courses in say biology so um, during the talk, you'll get to know why this is relevant. All right. So before, uh, since we don't have much time, uh, let me just get started. Okay. This is not going to be half as entertaining as the talk <laughs> that you just uh, witnessed, and I almost forgot that I had to give this talk after that. So I hope I do a decent job. Okay. So I hope you can all see these pictures on the screen. By the end of this talk, I don't expect you to have an answer for this right now. By the end of this talk, I hope you will have some idea of what is common between these three things. Uh, the one on the left, of course, you've all seen. Every day in the Hindu, you get a Sudoku, perhaps in Deccan Herald also, I'm not sure. Then on the right-hand side, you have a protein. okay, And in the middle, you have a glass. Uh, so what do all these things have in common? Uh, Huh? What? Do you already have an answer? Somebody already knows? Patterns. Patterns. Okay. Anything else? No? Okay. So let's put a pin in that and we'll come back to this question towards the end of this talk. Okay. So I'm going to talk mainly about combinatorial problems. I, I, can, I can walk around, right? No. Not with the call of my Take so these are the most trivial examples of a combina combinatorial problem. Right? Number one is the combination lock. Everyone knows what a combination lock is. And uh, essentially you need to find the right combination of numbers to unlock this lock. And the Rubik's cube is also a very famous problem. All of you know. Uh, yes. combinatorial problems but uh, you can have a lot of complexities in these problems so one of the uh, sort of more complex combinatorial problems is uh, something which is quite famous it's known as the traveling salesman problem uh, you might have heard of it and if you haven't it's quite easy to imagine so imagine there's this swiggy delivery guy who has to deliver uh, to 10 houses okay and so he, he can't keep going to one restaurant and picking up them and there's an algorithm. Apparently, Swiggy has come up with an algorithm and they keep boasting about it, uh, saying that they have optimized the distance to be traveled and optimized, minimized the cost uh, of uh, petrol, etc., uh, by telling the delivery guy to go in a certain route. Okay. So, the traveling salesman problem is just that. Suppose you have n cities which this traveling salesman has to visit and come back home for Christmas. What is the optimal route that the salesman would take? So, um, uh, compare this with the previous problem. In both of these, you have some unique solution at the end. 
you know that only one combination works for the lock and you also know that there is only one solution to the Rubik's cube. But it's not so obvious that the traveling salesman problem has only one solution. The solution being the circuit that the traveling salesman has to take. There could be a number of equally optimal solutions. Uh, this is the reason why <laughs> Ali Sage University becomes important. Um, this is a timetabling problem. Okay? This is also a combinatorial optimization uh, problem. So when you are trying to set a university timetable, um, essentially you have a set of courses and you might have different teachers and different students associated with the course. Okay? And the timetable is only going to work if you as a student is not required to be in two places at the same time. Right? So um, how do we optimize this? How do we make sure that the arrangement of courses is such that two people, the same person does not have to be in two places at the same time? This is another uh, combinatorial problem. All right, so how do we solve such problems? Uh, so the mathematicians have a whole different way of doing this. Um, they will go into, I mean, mathematics is all about deductive logic. But for me, it's all about experiments. Right? So mathematicians often map this such problems to known problems like matching and queuing and um, satisfiability, etc. All right? But uh, me, I do it by brute force. All right? I do it by using random numbers and my trusty machine. So uh, this is great because I don't know how to do matching and all that stuff. So uh, I'm going to just show you how uh, these problems are solved. All right, so this is the history of the way in which I actually approach such problems. And uh, the method that we use typically is called the Monte Carlo method. This guy here, Stanislaw Ulam, uh, you might have heard of him. Uh, mathematical physicist, particle physicist, was associated with Manhattan Project and so on. So at that time when he was around, uh, it so happened that these these computers start, just started becoming uh, more and more feasible to work with. So there was this massive computer called the ENIAC. I don't know how big it was. In my imagination, it's as big as this room, but I could be wrong. It might have been smaller. Okay. So um, he was actually sick, and you know, while he was in hospital, you can read this. Oops. Uh, he, the first, you can have a look at what. This says, first thoughts and attempts I made to practice the Monte Carlo were suggested by a question which occurred to me as I was convalescing from an illness and playing solitaire. So he was sick in a hospital and he was bored and playing solitaire. And the question that he asked himself is, uh, what are the chances that the uh, solitaire laid out of 52 cards just gives you the solution automatically? What, are the pro what is the probability of you getting the solution in the first try? Okay, so uh, of course, like any good mathematician, he first tried the abstract method, but uh, like any good physicist, he gave up <laughs> and uh, decided to do an experiment instead and use this uh, ENIAC to figure out the uh, answer. So this was actually the, a little bit of history about this method. It's called the Monte Carlo method because Stanislaw Ulam's uncle was addicted to gambling and spent a lot of time in Monte Carlo. Monte Carlo, if you don't know, is this place in Europe where there are a lot of casinos. Okay, so there was a lot of gambling, etc. happened there. And um, yeah, and so von, Neu von, von Neumann and Stan Ulam, both of them sort of came up with this method. And we continue to use it today for a very complicated problems. So let me just uh, illustrate this method using a very very simple problem which you all can do at home if you have some programming uh, knowledge. So uh, this is an illustration of the method where we are using the Monte Carlo to find the value of pi. Okay. So the idea is you inscribe a circle within a unit square. All right. The unit square of course has an area of 1 and the circle inside it will have an area of 
pi by 4 because the radius is 1, uh, the area of the circle is just uh, pi r square. <coughs> Sorry, the radius is not 1, the radius is half. The, so the area of the circle is just going to be pi by 4. All right. And if you just keep randomly throwing some, you, you, you don't need a computer. You can just uh, draw a square and insert the circle inside it and uh, take some peanuts and just as best as you can make sure they are randomly distributed within the square. And then after some time you count the number of peanuts which have landed within the circle divided by the total number of peanuts that you have thrown. And the answer should be close to pi by 4. You keep on adding more and more peanuts, you are going to get an answer which is converging to 3.14. So as you can see in this little GIF, initially you have some a value of pi which is not exactly 3.14, but as you keep adding points, you converge towards this value. So this is a brute force method of finding the value of pi. It doesn't have any series expansions or we don't do any integration. We don't have to imagine what is infinitesimal or infinite, nothing like that. We are using concrete numbers to figure out the value of pi. Okay. So this is just illustrating the spirit of the Monte Carlo method. It's not actually the method itself. So let me tell you what the method requires. So to implement the Monte Carlo method, we essentially need three things. We need a state okay. and uh, Vijay already told you what a state is. A state is uh, one of the many configurations of this bar. Pointing this way, that's a state. Pointing this way, that's also a state. So there are an infinite number of states of bala, but in combinatorial problems typically there are not an infinite number of states. There are a countable number of states. Okay. For example, in the traveling salesman problem, if you have n cities that you need to traverse through, then how many combinations are there which will take you from one city to another? Uh, want to think about that? <coughs> Let's say you have n cities or 10 cities. Okay. And they are all labeled. You have uh, city number 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way up to 9. So how many possible circuits are there? How many states are there? n factorial, right? So there are n factorial states, right? There are n factorial arrangements of these 10 objects, 10 factorial arrangements of these 10 objects. Um, you need to also define, so that is what a state is. A state is one of the many configurations which are uh, possible, okay? Uh, the second thing you need is you need to define a cost function. Physicists call this an energy, but in general it's called a cost function. A cost function is a function of the state, okay? And uh, that is the thing which you want to minimize or maximize or optimize, depending on the uh, context. All right. And finally, we need to define a move. So a move is something which takes one state to another state. So a rotation, for example, for Bala would be a move. All right. Um, for traveling salesmen and for other combinatorial problems, there are different kinds of moves. So, happens. All right. So apparently, my movies don't show up in the TV. So this is how the Monte Carlo algorithm works, but this is a greedy Monte Carlo algorithm, okay? which means that it doesn't like uh, like to do anything which is unfavorable. It doesn't like only wants to go, only wants to do favorable things all the time. You, we all know that is not how life works. So this greedy algorithm also has limitations. But let's just go through the greedy algorithm so that we can contrast it with better algorithms. So in a greedy algorithm, what you do is, you start at one of these states. So the algorithm starts with a state which is wrong. It's not going to solve your optimization. And then you make a, you decide that, okay, you, you decide on another possible state by making a move. 
And then if the move has a lower cost, then uh, you take it as a favorable move. So you change the state to the new state. If it is not, then choose another move. And then you keep going. Right. So in this way, what happens is, whenever there is a favorable move, whenever the cost is lower, you end up going there. But if the cost is higher, you don't go in there. Right. So if the state remains for a, in, in a, if the state remains a constant for a long enough time, you can terminate the algorithm and say that, oh, my optimization is done. All right, so let's look at what happens uh, when you use this kind of greedy algorithm. So, So imagine that uh, if this is basically a, a, a one-dimensional cost function that you are trying to optimize. It is a very simple cost function. Uh, the state essentially is what is represented on the x-axis. The state is some number between minus 1 and 1. And the cost function I have chosen to be just the quadratic function x squared. All right, so we know what the minimum of a quadratic is, uh, of x square is, we know where the minimum lies. So basically this point over here uh, has started in some random position, okay. It makes a move, it can either go right or left. Um, and if it goes right, it finds out what is the value of the cost at that new position. If it is greater, it won't go there. If it is less, it will go there. So that's what this is showing. So of course it works because uh, the cost function is really simple. It has only one minimum, and so you know this is bound to work. Okay. But the moment you have a slightly more complicated cost function, like this one over here, it has two minima, and the two minima are not equivalent to each other. They're not. They don't have the same cost. The one. The one on the right here has a higher cost than the one on the left. Right? So, do you think this greedy algorithm will work for this case? What do you think? You make random moves. Do you, where, where does the minimum actually lie? Where is the actual minimum of this function? Ah, so, it's at that minus that point, right? But oh, do you think that with just random moves, uh, you would get to that minus one? What do you think? There are only two answers. Give me one of those answers. Yes? Okay. With what probability will it go to this <laughs> correct one? It's not necessarily true. It might just get stuck in the higher uh, optimum. So in this case, that's what is happening. So you can see that this point is moving around and all of that, but it never actually gets a chance to go and explore that deeper minimum. Instead, it got stuck in that local minimum, and any random move that it made was unfavorable. So it just got stuck. It could just not move from it. Okay. And this is the problem with the greedy algorithm. If you only decide, I am only going to make favorable moves, then you are never going to be able to explore all the minima that are there in your uh, in your system. Right. So that's not good. It's not something wrong with this. Uh, thankfully, there are uh, ways out of this, and that's what. Uh, not so tech savvy. In spite of doing computer programming all the time. All right. So thankfully, there are ways out of this, and one of the ways is basically looking at physics and getting some inspiration from it. Actually, one of the things I want to impress on you guys during this talk is that it's good to have inputs from different subjects. So uh, if you just focus on one your own pet subject, then uh, often you will not get inspiration, which uh, happens to work very well, all right? And uh, uh, nature has, 
actually uses these algorithms in different ways. And if we just recognize it, we can make use of it to do optimization problems. So what happens is, you might have heard in school at least, you might have tried to make crystals of copper sulfate. I don't know if you've tried ever. Okay, maybe you have. So the best way to make a crystal of copper sulfate is first, of course, you nicely dissolve a lot of copper sulfate in water. You make a super saturated solution. And then you have to cool it. If you cool it really fast, you're going to get a very bad looking crystal. It won't be crystalline, it'll be sort of powdery, it'll have a lot of facets. Which is not a good thing in this case. <laughs> okay? But if you cool it really, really slowly, then you end up getting a near perfect crystal. All right? Something which you could call a crystal. Okay? And that cooling really slowly has a name. It has a name in metallurgy and uh, it's called annealing. All right, so uh, if you look at these two GIFs, in the, you know, on the left hand side you have this one GIF where if you cool it very fast, essentially you make crystals of small size, but it's not, um, it's not a perfect crystal. And on the right hand side, if you slowly cool the system, you see that you make slightly larger crystals. Still not perfect, but they make better crystals. Right? So the slower you manage to cool things down, this is I'm talking about physics. It's a completely physics related problem here. We haven't even started talking about optimization and how it comes to it. But we are going to take inspiration from this system and apply it to optimization. All right? So how do we get inspired by this? Essentially, we need to simulate the process of slow cooling so that we do not get stuck in local minima. You want to go to the minimum, the actual minimum, so you cool slower and slower and slower. Okay? So this is the, um, this is the sort of takeaway from uh, physics that uh, actually helps us go to a global minimum. So, so the algorithm that is inspired from this particular process, of course we call it simulated annealing because it's annealing and we have simulated it. Uh, but here, it's not a greedy algorithm. We just don't, we don't just accept favorable moves. Sometimes we also accept unfavorable moves, which means that okay, you might be wanting to go to the bottom of a hill, right? But maybe there is a deeper hill beyond a certain valley. In order to get to that deeper, uh, deeper valley beyond a certain hill, if you want to get to the deeper valley, you have to climb that hill in between. Okay, so your algorithm has to allow for that unfavorable move for you to climb the hill in between. That's what simulated annealing does. So. The algorithm in simulated annealing is if the cost of the new state is less than the cost of the old state, definitely go there. Just like the greedy algorithm, definitely you go there. But if it is not the same, if it is in fact greater, then you go there but with a certain probability. And this person called Boltzmann sort of figured this out, what that probability is. And uh, so we know that you can have an unfavorable move, uh, unfavorable move can uh, be accepted with a certain probability and that probability is exponential of the difference of the cost divided by the temperature. Okay. So this is something that I just want you to take for granted because we don't have time to prove why this is the case. But the fact is that the temperature somehow suddenly comes into the picture. The probability of accepting an unfavorable move means I am at a certain point and I throw, uh, I toss a coin, I have to decide whether to go down or up. Okay. And uh, the coin tells me that I need to go up. So how do I decide whether to go <coughs> up or not? I find the difference between the energy of the state which is here and my own state. I find E raised to the difference of energy divided by the temperature. Okay. And then I choose another random number. If that random number happens to be less than this number, I go there. Otherwise, I stay where I am and wait for 
the next uh, move. Okay, so this is actually this uh, algorithm called simulated anemia. And just as an illustration, we look at what happens to the point which was looking for the global minimum using this algorithm. All right, so earlier, remember that little point was getting stuck in the lower, the minimum on the right hand side. But here, there is enough chance for it to actually. It, it does do some climbing as well. You are allowing for some climbing. So eventually what happens is, now it has gone out of the picture, but it comes back. And eventually what happens is, it can actually find the global minimum. Eventually, <laughs> to wait for it. Uh, Let's wait. Oh, there it goes. Slowly it finds the global minimum. Okay. So there it is. Right? In this particular case, it worked. Now, there are so many uncertainties. This is not at all a nice algorithm. If I tell this to mathematicians, they'll say, oh, all your physicists are garbage. And it's true. There are many pitfalls in this algorithm also. So I said you slowly reduce the temperature. What do you mean by slowly? How slowly should you reduce the temperature? If you reduce it very slowly, then you are more likely to go to the global minimum than not. Okay. But if you reduce it fast, you are in the same spot as you were before. It is almost the same as the greedy algorithm. If the temperature is brought down to, brought down to zero very fast, then it's as bad as the greedy algorithm. So the problem with simulated annealing is that you, it takes a very, very long time because you have to really cool the system really slowly. You have to reduce the temperature very slowly in order to be guaranteed to reach the global minimum. So, um, so it's not nice because you know we want answers fast these days and. Um, your boss is sitting on your head and saying, have you found the global minimum? And <laughs> you can't say like look, the algorithm is taking a lot of time, even if it is. Okay, so um, this is okay, but not the best that we can do. All right. So I just want to pause here and reflect a bit. What I've said so far is that essentially we are trying to find the minimum of some function, some cost function, using random moves. Okay. Using a greedy algorithm, you are quite likely to be stuck in a local minimum, which is not the true optimum of that function. Okay. Using a, an, a physics-inspired algorithm, you have a better chance of finding the global minimum. So this is what I said so far. And now let's just try to apply the same. I've used a very simple example here where we have this function, polynomial function. I know the shape of this polynomial function. I know I can see where the minimum is. So um, it's kind of uh, really a toy model that I've shown you so far. All right. So let's try and apply the same uh, simulated annealing uh, algorithm to a real life problem, like the Swiggy delivery guy. Uh, let's try to apply it to the traveling silicon problem. So I'm just going to give you an example here of how you would choose a state, an energy function or a cost function, and a move. Okay. And using the same logic, we'll try to do it for another optimization problem. Right. So traveling salesman problem, what is a state? A state is one of the many combinations. So uh, in our in a picture of a traveling salesman, we have say uh, five cities, just for simplicity. Let's say the Wiggy guy has to go to five places, right? So we give these five places an index. Um, so the indices are just 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. All right? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And there are uh, five factorial possible arrangements of this. So, what did I do? 
So, yeah, we start with one of the many sequences. We start with an initial condition, one of the many random combinations of this, these uh, five numbers. So, maybe our initial state is say 2, 1, 0, 4, 3. The cost is what? The cost function is essentially the distance traversed. Okay. So, these five cities have their own respective coordinates. You can always find the distance between each consecutive city, add, the, add up all the distances to get the total distance. So, your, uh, this is your state. And the cost would just be, uh, you know, your distance between 2 and 1 plus distance between 0 and 1 plus, etc. So you look at each pair of cities, find the total distance, and that's the thing that you want to minimize. That's your distance. One possible move that you can use to go from one configuration to another is to just choose one of the cities randomly and switch the order with the neighbor. So a move, a move is something like this. Maybe I've chosen this and I've, I'm going to switch the order between these two. So in going from this to this, the move basically uh, gives you a different configuration. Now you find the cost of this move, find the cost of this state. And if the cost is actually less, you go there. If the cost is higher, you go there with a certain acceptance probability, which depends on the <coughs> temperature. This is the idea. All right. So I hope you've got the broad idea. What I want you to do now is to come up with a scheme, a similar kind of scheme which I have described here, but for this <coughs> game, Sudoku. All of us know about Sudoku, right? Is this a combinatorial problem? Does it have a unique solution? Yes, okay. This particular Sudoku has a unique solution. Is it possible that you have Sudokus without unique solution? No. Yes. In what in what cases? What's that? More? Say that again. Say loudly. I mean, I uh, basically I started doing all of this making completely nonsensical statements and wrong statements. So you can feel free to be wrong. What is it? Is it does it have more than one solution? Is that pos is it possible that Sudoku has more than one solution? No. No. Okay. Actually it is possible. Okay. It is possible. I mean I asked you the question, so the answer must be yes it is possible. <laughs> If, if you have lesser inform, if you give lesser information, then it's definitely possible. Yeah, you can have a blank Sudoku with so many uh, solutions. Right? There are so many. I don't know how many. Another combinatorial problem for you. So if you have less number, less information than you actually require to solve the problem, you could prob prob probably have more than one <coughs> solution to the Sudoku. Right? You could also have larger size Sudokus. It's not necessary that you have only uh, 1 to 9. It's not necessarily just a 9 by 9 square. You can have 16 by 16 squares. Uh, it depends on what number. You can go from you know, 1 to 16, for example, not just 1 to 9. Okay. So those higher uh, size, bigger size Sudoku, uh, it's not clear that we have unique solutions. A priori, it's not clear. Uh, maybe there is some reductive process which makes it clear to you, but I don't know. I still don't know the answer. I think that it's not necessarily unique. So what is the state here? Can you start, what is this? Can you just think about uh, the three things that you need to solve this Sudoku in the method that I described? Completely random, no logic required, no pen paper and, you know, elimination of numbers, nothing like that. What is the state? Uh, what is the cost and what is the possible move? Let's think about it. Can I generate some random solution to this and call it a state? Okay. 
Okay, is this acceptable? I will just take all the empty squares and fill it randomly with numbers between 1 and 9. Is that okay? Yes, no. Okay. You, you can do that and then? Rearrange the numbers. Okay. Who said no? Why did you say no? Because that is not Sudoku, right? <laughs> but the thing here is that you can be wrong. That is the nice thing about Monte Carlo. You are allowed to be a little dumb. <laughs> Works for me. So you can start with a completely wrong solution. I can fill in repetitions, no problem. I can just fill in 55555. Okay. It's wrong, I know it's wrong. But it's one of the many possible states, which is not the correct answer. But you're not right away looking for the correct answer. You're looking for some state and then you're going to move towards the correct answer. So a state is just any any bunch of numbers put into this 9 by 9 grid keeping the rest of the known numbers the same. You can fill in whatever you want in any of the boxes. That's the state. Okay, so let's do that. And uh, maybe after that we can fill in, figure out what the cost is. So let's. Uh, so what do I have? I have 5, 3, 6, 9, 8. Uh, 7, 1, 9, 5, uh, 6 here, 8, 4, 7, 6, 4, 1, 9, 8, 2, 8, 5, and 7, 9. Okay, this is what I start with and I am just going to start with any random initial state. There is no necessity for it to have any of the constraints that are required by Sudoku. You just put in whatever you want. You know you are starting with the wrong answer. Okay, so I am just going to put in uh, some numbers. Some, just some numbers. Maybe I will just put 1, 2, 3, 4 here. Okay. And um, so I have got one column. Uh, I will just fill in one more row. Uh, again I will put in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay, so I have just filled in this column and this row with some numbers. And of course you can continue this process and fill it with as many numbers you want. But this, this is not the solution. Obviously it is not the solution. Why? First of all, you have so many repetitions of digits, right? That is not allowed. Huh. And I have not even looked at what they add up to. <laughs> they should add up to some the same number, but I haven't even looked at it. Obviously, this is not the right. So there should be a non-zero cost for this state. The cost should be something which is not a minimum. It should be a high cost because it's not the correct answer. So, do you have any uh, ideas for what we could choose as a cost function for this? There are many options. Uh, you could think of some options. Any idea? A cost should tell you how much does it deviate from the ideal, right? If it does not deviate from the ideal, then the cost should be zero. If it deviates a lot from the ideal, the cost should be high. So, what happened? Oh, there's an answer. Yeah. Sum, okay. Yeah. So you can sum up each row or column, and what should it actually add up to? One to nine. What's that number? Sum of the first nine natural numbers. Forty-five. Okay. Forty-five. It should add up to. So the difference between forty-five and that sum. You square up that difference, right? You square that difference so that you only find the deviation from the sum. That is a possible uh, cost. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Another possibility is that you just count the number of repetitions for each row and column. So, for example, here you have 
one being re repeated twice five. anything else five also is repeated so there are actually two repetitions for this particular row and here also there are a bunch of repetitions i believe no four four okay four is repeated so i have one okay so for each row and column you can find out how many numbers are repeated add up the number of repetitions and that could be another option for a cost so it's really up to you okay and the algorithm doesn't really depend on the fine nature of the cost function that you choose all it has to say is that you this ideal should have no cost anything which is wrong should have a cost then okay so the cost this is a, this is these are good cost functions both of them are good candidates for cost function and the move again it can be anything so it's in this is using random numbers so any random idea can also work okay so you take uh, any random row and you could maybe replace one of the numbers with some other number okay something like that you can choose any number of moves for solving the sudoku problem uh, and this will work okay uh, there are n number of youtube videos where people have solved sudoku using Monte Carlo method. It works. You know how long it takes in computer time? In real time, actually. No, not second. It takes three hours. Okay, so it's damn slow. A human can do much better job, <laughs> right? So these dumb algorithms, they don't do such a great job all the time. All right. So that is something to keep in mind. Not seconds. that we <laughs> it takes roughly 3 hours that particular thing took a long time this particular thing took a long time to solve 3 hours all right so here's this is an example so all of you can go back if you like programming uh, think about how to solve sudoku how to solve rubik's cube and all of these games that you uh, are basically combinatorial games uh, uh, try to think of how would you would uh, figure out what a state is what a move is and what the cost is and uh, write a monte carlo for it see if it works all right so uh, first we had some inspiration from physics which gave us the simulated annealing algorithm okay but i also happen to like biology quite a lot and one of my colleagues I don't know. I I always thought this quotation was really nice. Biology is the embodiment of computation, but uh, I don't know who to attribute it to. So I am just attributing it to some unnamed colleague. I I know who I heard it from, but maybe it came from somebody else. I don't know. Uh, this is a really if if you. Uh, you know if you haven't really encountered biological computation biology organism doing computation over there then you probably won't appreciate this so i'll give you a couple of examples to show you how biology is the embodiment of computation okay nature is constantly doing uh, uh, computation right evolution is basically one hack after the other mutation is happening uh something doesn't work so some something changes you know that's what it people do something doesn't work they make a patch to fix it maybe that doesn't work so then somebody else makes another patch and fixes that okay nature is constantly doing this all right so here this is a uh i don't know what organism this is but many organisms do the same thing So imagine you are a eagle or some bird or something bird of prey and you are looking for food okay you have a vast landscape to go and explore for food one possible way you can explore is you choose a place and then you just keep doing brownian motion random walk here 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 and finally you can get a whiff of your food and you stop but that is a really really inefficient process a better way to do it is you first do a little brownian uh, walk around one place and then suddenly go to a totally different place okay something something i don't know what is here i can't find anything i'm going to leap and go somewhere else 
And then I go and figure out, oh, I go and search for food here. I, find, I don't find anything. Then I leap and go to some other place. Right? So this is a levee flight. This is not a Brownian walk, but this is more like a, a levee walk. This is called a levee flight. And it's very common in many, many organisms which are foraging for food. Okay, so this actually happens in many organisms which are foraging for food. In this way, they are more efficient in finding food. So let's keep this one thing in mind. And then I talk about this other situation. Uh, this other example I'm going to talk about is something that I actually worked on during my postdoc. Uh, have you heard of the mite? Have you heard of mitosis and meiosis? Yes. <laughs> okay. Great. So these are the processes which lead to cell division, right? And I know mathematicians don't like names, so I'm not going to bore you with too many names. But here is how mitosis actually happens. Of course, there are these chromosomes which sort of line up in some equator. We're not going to bother about how that happens. But there is this point here, this point here, which is sending out filaments from uh, radiating outwards. The job of that filament is to go and capture these chromosomes. Okay. So when this point is growing filaments and sending them outwards, it has no idea where that chromosome is. It's just going to send out, you know, it's, imagine there are molecules, right? Molecules are sitting and doing this computation for you. Nobody is sitting from outside and telling it, oh, I can see the chromosome here. You got to go there. No. It's doing it step by step. So how is the centros? Uh, how is this molecule? Uh, <coughs> how are these filaments going to know where to go in order to go and capture that uh, chromosome? This is the big problem. So how does it do it? First, some filament starts to grow in a random direction. It just starts to put out filaments in random direction. Okay, and maybe that filament is actually going towards the chromosome. But agnostically, it decides, okay, I'm just going to break this film. Or this one is actually going towards the chromosome. In spite of that, the filament is going to uh, crumble. Okay. So it has this process. There's something called the dynamic instability of microtubules. These tubules, filaments are called microtubules. All right. And this process of just randomly stopping whatever you have were doing before. Uh, in this particular context, it's called dynamic instability. So uh, it turns out that this process of sending out blindly filaments in different directions and just randomly just removing them is much more efficient than sending out microtubules in every direction and not, uh, not uh, dissociating them. Okay. The scaffolding has to be dynamic. It turns out that this process is actually much more efficient. So this capture of chromosomes happens to be faster in spite of the fact that you might have a microtubule moving towards this and then you suddenly stop and break that microtubule and restart the whole process all over again. So this process we can uh, incorporate into our procedure into our algorithm. So we can take inspiration from biology and incorporate it into our algorithm. And you might have experienced this in real life also. Often you are stuck in some place, you are stuck, you may be looking for your keys or something. Okay, and so you, what you are trying to do is maybe retrace all your steps and then trying to find it out and trying to memory blah blah blah. Alright, but often you might find that by just restarting the whole thing, let me think about this afresh. Let me think about this, my homework afresh. Then you are more likely to get to the solution rather than if you just keep on going in the same direction doggedly. Okay? So this is the sort of philosophical uh, uh, take away from this. Uh, but the funny thing is that it works and it works to our advantage. It actually hastens the process of capture of these chromosomes. Right. So here in this case, we have these random restarts, random flights which are huge jumps which are taking you from one place to another. So you are sort of changing the initial condition 
restarting the entire process of search. Here also you are restarting the entire process of search. So I actually worked on this uh, with a student who was interested in computation but uh, was a biology student. So I had to come up with a problem which, which he would be interested in. So we decided to uh, try out this random restart process for a traveling salesman problem. Okay. So what we did was uh, you randomly restart the entire traveling salesman algorithm. Uh, I don't know if I showed you the movie for traveling salesman. <coughs> Let me just go back uh, and play this movie. So here I have a, a set of cities which are marked by the points there. And by simulated annealing, you can actually find an optimal path. Okay, and on the right hand side, you actually have the cost function changing as a function of time. So the cost function is slowly going towards some minimum value, and simulated annealing is giving you that circuit. So this traveling salesman problem we tried out with random restart and asked, okay, how does the search time depend on the probability of restart? So it's very uh, interesting and easy to understand how it depends on it. So let's just look at how it actually depends on this. It turns out that for low values of probability of restart, that means you just, you might get stuck in local minima. Right? You don't restart the process, you just try traveling salesman. If it gets stuck in one circuit, it can never come out of it. Okay, Because you're not restarting the process at all. For low values of this probability, the search time is pretty high. For high values of probability, then also the search time is high. Why is that? If you keep on restarting the process, every two, sec every two steps you restart the process, then basically the algorithm has no opportunity to go and find a minimum at all. Right? So there is a sweet spot. There's a spot in which you actually have the lowest value of uh, search time. So there's some sweet spot between high val low values of probability of restart and high values of restart where you get an optimal search time. So this is telling you that the <laughs> in spite of the non-intuitive nature of this random restart algorithm, it actually gives you something which might work. So, so whatever I have told you so far has very little to do with that nice one dimensional function that I first plotted for you. So we have no idea what the cost function actually looks like. We have no idea how to plot it. It's not even one dimensional. It's multi dimensional, not even two dimensional, multi dimensional cost function. So there's no way in which we can actually visualize it or plot it. Okay, uh, we don't know the shape of this cost function. If the function was something like a broadly funnel shape, something like this, then we could say, oh, okay, you know, even if it gets stuck here, maybe something a little peak would take it here, and eventually you would find the minimum, right? But what if the cost function had a shape like this, flat everywhere, flat everywhere? But suddenly, just for one configuration, it's like that. Huh? This is a disastrous cost function. People call it the golf ball, golf course potential. So this is really like finding that one combination which works. It's not that you can make series of moves which will lead you towards better and better combinations, better, more and more optimal combinations. But there is, everything is equally bad, but there is that only one uh, combination which is good. All right? So your random uh, algorithms will really take insane amount of time if you try to solve solve it using uh, solve it for cases where you have this golf course kind. Of does that make sense? Okay. Uh, again, we don't know whether you get unique solutions or not. There's many, many things we have no idea about. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you a story. 
and the story is about how our uh, how our university sort of evolved so in the beginning we had this grand idea that we should allow students to take courses from all over the all over the you know, curriculum i should be able to take courses in philosophy if i want etc okay so uh, so i set about writing a code to find out the timetable of to generate such a timetable which would allow everybody to do whatever they want to okay and uh, you know my boss not really my boss but yeah my boss was <laughs> basically saying can't you do this can't you do that and i would never know whether i had the right answer or not okay i i would always think uh, maybe there is a better way maybe there is a better solution all right so finally i decided that uh, this is garbage i should figure out the nature of this problem so that i can uh, uh, make sure that whatever i done i have done is the best i can do and one cannot do any better than that okay so it turns out uh, that there is some wisdom again from physics which i can rely on to make sense of uh, the time tabling problem so i'm going to talk about that a little bit because so for that we need to understand this idea of what a spin glass is okay so uh, i'm just going to quickly go through some basic concepts of the spin glass and uh, we'll end very soon because i don't think i have too much time anyway so um a spin is basically like a magnetic moment okay and you can sort of in two spins can interact two neighboring spins can interact with each other so there's an interaction sometimes two neighboring spins can have an interaction which uh, actually favors parallel orientation of spins okay so in some uh, cases uh, these spins like to actually orient parallelly and in some cases they like to orient in an anti parallel fashion so in one is called a ferromagnet the other is an anti ferromagnet so picture b over here is actually a ferromagnet where you have the most favorable configuration is when all the spins are parallel and picture b is an anti ferromagnet where every alternate spin is uh, has the opposite orientation okay so these are uh, This, this is a sort of famous model actually in physics it's called the ising model and people use it not just for magnets but for various things uh, but there is something interesting about uh, um, this system which was actually discovered and uh, last year's nobel prize was about this a little bit last year's nobel prize went to three people two of them uh, are climate scientists and the third one is uh, parisi who actually got it for this particular for his uh, exposition on spin glasses okay so i'm going to describe a simple system where uh, you get this phenomenon called frustration i i can see a lot of you are getting frustrated because i'm talking about physics or maybe because the last talk was so much more entertaining than this one. all right so um what is frustration okay so let me uh introduce to you a frustrated system this is called the triangular anti ferromagnet so i told you that an anti ferromagnet is when parallel uh, neighboring spins like to actually orient <coughs> anti parallel to each other okay. all this is great if you have a square lattice but the moment you have a triangular lattice you run into an issue so if we have an ant if we have a triangular lattice uh we can put down one spin like this the neighboring one likes to be anti parallel to this one so the neighboring one is actually pointing downwards but we have no idea what this third spin is likely to do it's frustrated should it be up should it be down should it be up should it be down okay so this is called a frustrated system in physics very evocative word okay um and whenever you have uh, uh, 
both parallel and anti parallel configurations possible you get a heavily frustrated system which is called a spin glass the spins don't know where to orient because one of the neighbors likes parallel orientation the other neighbor likes anti parallel orientation okay so the interactions between neighboring spins can either prefer parallel or anti parallel and that is something which is random randomly this this uh, distributed okay so these are uh, this kind of system here this is a par ferromagnet this is an anti ferromagnet this one here is a spin glass the problem with the spin glass is that you can uh, it's not a problem it's actually a good thing because it tells me that i can tell my boss look boss you can have multiple solutions i have got one of them and you have to be happy with it <laughs> and that's uh, you look at this this immediately tells you why you can have multiple equally optimal or equally suboptimal solution this one is one of the possibility the other one is this both of them are equally bad but they are the best i can do so not in not all optimization problems do you actually get a good solution you get a solution that you have to live with that's the end okay <laughs> and that's what physics uh, actually is telling us so it tells us that if you manage to map your problem onto a spin glass then um, you can call it a day and say okay i've done the best i can no i'm going home i'm not going to break my head on it anymore all right so this is the wisdom from physics and it so happens that you can use it for time tabling so i won't tell you too much about uh, all of this state and all of that uh, not necessary uh, i tell you how i thought about the time table problem and why is it similar to a spin glass okay so to understand the time table problem first uh, what we do is we draw a network of forces we have different kinds of forces i put up introduction to palmistry and advanced randomness and something else some made up forces all right so let these forces be the nodes of a network make a network and the forces are the nodes of the network okay so i have a bunch of nodes now if any two nodes have nothing in common means they have no teachers or students in common then you can draw an edge between them okay so you have force a b c etc these two forces are very like unlikely to have anybody in common perhaps they are you know i don't know what like linear algebra and uh, what's the other end of it macroeconomics well, actually there can be overlap between these two linear algebra and um, um romantic literature eh? <laughs> in relation to palmistry or okay. <laughs> Okay, so there are no teachers who will teach both of these. Agreed? Maybe there are, but in my college there are. We are not so interdisciplinary, and very rarely are there students also who take both of these courses. So I am going to join join these two courses with an edge. Okay, so all pairs of courses which have nothing in common, you draw an edge between them. and now you can kind of see that that's the actual network that came about for apu scientific actually it looks really ridiculous and complicated but what you do see is that there are cliques of connected uh, nodes anyway this is not so important i tell you why it is similar to a triangular antiferromagnet okay so let's take a simple case where you have only three courses a b and c a and b have nothing in common so i put an edge between them a and c also have nothing in common so i put an edge between them b and c have one uh, annoying student who wants to take political philosophy and quantum mechanics okay so <laughs> there's a this that edge just doesn't exist between these b and c now in the time table essentially you can have a and b happening together at the same time because 
they have nobody in common similarly b and c can also happen at the same time nobody in common but a and c cannot happen at the same time right so either you can choose a and b to be happening at the same time or a and c to be happening at the same time you can't put a b and c in the same slot because b and c will have a problem okay so this is you can also you can see immediately that this has uh, two solutions either a and b are happening at the same time or b and c are happening at the same time and that's the best you can do so even for this tiny situation where you have only three courses already you are faced with a uh, uh, you know already you can see that there are multiple solutions that can arise so the moment you have a spin glass you are in trouble and it so happens that you can actually mathematically also map the timetable on to the spin glass but i won't talk about that here for the lack of time um <laughs> so this kind of uh, those of you who know a little bit one person i can see in this audience who probably know the person uh, this is like a signature okay if you see something like this this kind of curve this is a susceptibility curve and uh, this is like a signature of a glass don't expect you to understand that just take my word for it the susceptibility function has a cusp for a glass okay so one is able to see that in this timetable problem you actually see a lot of signatures of glassy behavior you can map it exactly onto a spin glass you can uh, you can reason out why there is a a uh, degeneracy or why there are multiple equally suboptimal or optimal minima and you can also uh, look at the data and see that oh look there is a signature of a spin glass so here is a situation where you are taking something from physics a material a ferromagnet paramagnet antiferromagnet and you are comparing it with what time table right so what i want to impress upon you is that you should actually be aware of the different phenomena that happen in nature so that you can incorporate it in your thinking okay, not everything is deductive some things are inspired so maybe just open your eyes a little bit and then uh, look at the different phenomena around you perhaps they give you ideas which you may not have thought of on your own okay so while looking at the uh, time table problem i went through quora and all that and tried to find out what other people were doing what i found out was that there was this time tabling competition which was held every year in some toronto university or something like that and uh, invariably simulated annealing would be the one which won that competition and uh, and i also went through quora and everything where i was trying to understand if other people had thought about the computational complexity of this problem you might have heard that there is np hard and for it something is solvable within polynomial time or exponential might have heard of hard and easy problems i don't know but uh, i found this very telling this is this problem is not just np hard <coughs> np insane but also because in time tabling many people have constraints i have to go pick up my daughter at 3 o'clock i have table tennis to play at 7 o'clock all that kind of stuff so it's uh, insane and more reason, for more reason and uh, also want to show that look this is actually a well studied problem looking at the computational complexity of spin glass model and uh, this person barahona uh, makes a point that np hardness of the problem suggests that it's very unlikely that a polynomial algorithm can exist to solve this so if you think about your optimization problem long enough and see that it actually maps on to a spin glass it's very unlikely that you will be able to find a polynomial algorithm which will solve it in the time that you desire okay it's not very scalable problem okay, so i'm going to end I'll end with a tweet about uh, last year's Nobel Prize. This is a tweet about Parisi's Nobel Prize. 
it says loosely spin glasses have a kind of option paralysis. So there are so many equivalent configurations, how does the material choose which one to be in and this leads to a slow response time. So the GIF has not come about, but <coughs> the GIF basically says I don't know and I don't know and I, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> Finally we don't have a, an answer. Thank you.